welcome to another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Today, I am so excited to have JJ Reynolds on with me. How are you, JJ? Hey, doing well. Thanks so much for asking. Let me tell you guys a little bit about JJ. He manages the team at Media Authentic, a measurement agency, and is an instructor at betterthandata.com, where he shows agencies how to increase their use of actionable data to retain clients longer and improve bottom lines. JJ spends most of his time creating the strategy of a measurement journey with the goal of delivering the most actionable reports possible. Using a system to derive action and benchmark is the core of every business JJ interacts with. In his free time, he loves mountain biking, hiking, and skiing around the Reno Tahoe area. So you, you're using a lot of words that resonate with me, data, measurement, all of these things. I love, I love, I love those words, those metrics. So how did you start your career and how did you get to what you're doing today? All right. I'll give you the uh, abridged version, but uh, it, it started all with content creation. So uh, back um, a while back, I started creating videos as a videographer. Really, really random. I would shoot videos for... Um, as a single person, just solopreneur, shooting videos, all that fun for mostly wineries. Um, slowly got into actually putting some money and ad spend behind those videos and so moving into the promotional side of things on that marketing um, journey there. Realized that most companies uh, had no idea what was actually good or bad. They were just how good you could be sold on uh, to any agency that was willing to take your money. Um, and slowly dove into the numbers, the underlying metrics uh, of, around the businesses that we were working with uh, and slowly went out on my own uh, into the world of freelancing as a um, analytics consultant. So I was helping with uh, kind of browser based metrics. So that's all the, the Facebook pixels and Google analytics and all of those types of things um, and slowly gained traction on that front and uh, really found uh, home a piece inside of that world. Uh, now we build custom tools uh, as for sales teams, marketing teams, um, client facing internal tools uh, around all of those different pieces. And we like to uh, have a team and all that, all that jazz that comes along with that. So that's the quick and dirty version of it. But I hope that touched the, the, the majority of who JJ is. <laughs> Ah, so how did you even get into wanting to create content, wanting to do videos? How did that, how did you even spark that love? Yeah, it's like all the way back to honestly high school. I'll just shoot videos for fun. Um, and then that carried with me until university uh, when I went to uh, a college and ended up just doing on the side for making money for when you're a college student, you could make money making videos for wineries. It was much better than getting paid uh, working at the, uh, whatever college job you could get. And it also like really accelerated the like world into the business world because I was working with businesses of like sending quotes and doing all of that like business stuff that no one really thinks about when you are in a creative role um, and accelerated me into that space um, much faster just because I was doing it in like in university. Mm, that's so good. You know, a lot of times these days, people, whether they're in college or their early career, they think those things that they just do just for fun or, you know, to make some side money, they don't realize how much they can actually help. Uh, recently, I was talking to somebody and they're like, how did you go from being a chemist to being in sales? Like those two things don't even connect. And I was like, you know, if you talk to any of my friends from high school or even younger, they'll be like, well, Celine was always a hustler. <laughs> she was always a tough negotiator, right? And so it's like those things that we enjoy doing or that we're innately good at that really set us up for our career. Exactly. I couldn't agree more with that. Like the videography stuff that I, I don't do so much now, but uh, I, I think it really helps when you think of the like in the relation to data, right? Opposite side of the spectrum of, of most interactions is data and creativity. But uh, I think one of the biggest things is thinking of the end result while you're starting the planning process. And that like works for when we're working with like sales pipelines of how many phone calls should be given at what time range. And then how do you visualize, is it working, right? And you have to think of that end result of how do we visualize, is it working? when you're starting the data collection process of like, okay, we're going to have people log 
how the call went, or we're going to have people log um, when they had a good call or bad. Like, what what are the what, what data points do we need? And thinking of that end result at the beginning, I think, is where that videography creativity comes to mind. Similar to creating a canvas uh, where you don't know what you're doing until you get there. <laughs> mm. I love it. So you took this um, innate passion, this desire that you had, and you said that you got into the data, into the analytics. So how does somebody who has this creative spirit, you know, content creation, videography, how did you transition into that world of of data and analytics and and thinking about things in that sense? I think it goes back to what you just said of like, of, oh, why like why did you do this? Like, oh, what was your childhood thing? Like, I always were a hustler, always a thing. I was always overly curious, <laughs> like in in school and things. I was always the one asking too many questions and under like getting too deep into something. And that's pretty much what happened. Where I was shooting videos for businesses um, that were like sizable wineries mostly, and they'd be like, "Cool, we have a video, awesome, double thumbs up." see you later, but it never get published. It never, nothing would ever happen to the video. And so I, I thought I was like, okay, I can get into media buying. I can spend money to get impressions, spend money to get clicks, spend money to get revenue, all of those pieces. But then the underlying like pieces of that is, okay, how does this information get here? What information do we actually have to collect? How do we know if it's working or not? What's the definition of, is it working? Um, So I kept asking all those questions until I got to being very, very proficient at um, setting all these pieces up that were just auxiliary to the main piece of running the media. And then like from there, it's like hired a team, got systematized. And now that's all we do is like ask those questions. So now I'm that annoying child of asking too many questions, but I get to do it and get paid for it with businesses. And they're grateful for all the questions that we ask. (laughs) It's, it is really amazing to be stepping into the thing that um, I love telling people when they get into sales, that thing that people said was so annoying about you, talking too much, asking too many questions, being too curious, being too quiet, whatever that thing is, that's what's going to make you really excellent at sales. And so yours was your curiosity. So many times in sales, I always say that we're looking at the wrong metrics. We're looking at the lagging indicators. We're looking at the outputs. We're looking at closed deals. We're looking at how many proposals we get. But it's all about the leading indicators, right? It's about the inputs, the things we do before that you don't even know what's happening, how that's going to turn into closed deals or number of proposals or discovery meetings or whatever. That is so, so very important. Yeah, exactly. And the... I think one of the biggest pieces of that is if you look at just the outcomes, uh, it's kind of like looking at your bank account, right? Like if you just look at your bank account, but you had no idea of how the money got there. You had no idea of any of those pieces. When the money doesn't show up <laughs> one, one, one month, you're like, whoa, 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 where'd that go? But you have no concept of it. But like if you have a better idea of saying, okay, how I make money is doing these things, how that makes money, how people find out about that thing are – a, B, and C. And if you can think all at the top of that, it, it's much more actionable because at the end of the day, if, if sales aren't where you are, closed deals aren't where they're supposed to be, you should know that by like, I don't know, 45 days out, depending on your sales cycle, maybe 90 days or 120 days or a year if you're enterprise, <laughs> depending on the sales cycle that you have. And so you shouldn't be, uh-oh, this month we're not going to make it. It should be, uh-oh, in February we're not going to make it in 90 days or whatever month you're in. Um, so that's my take on that. <laughs> yeah, this this, this um, magical thing of forecasting and not forecasting like, oh, let me, uh, okay, the wind's blowing west, east. Yeah, I think, I think we'll be okay. I think the pipeline looks good. Um, but really focusing on what are those metrics? What are those key indicators? What are the things that drive change? So we talk about behaviors that drive change, behaviors that enable sales. And so really taking that and putting it into a nice little package is what you've done. Like really taking those behaviors, taking those key indicators, those leading indicators, as I said before, the things that happened way before we're even talking about a sale closing and focusing on those so that we can ensure that our pipeline is nice and predictable. 
Exactly. Yeah. The way that I like to frame it with people um, is you have intentions and you have outcomes. That's pretty much it. Like you can intend for something to happen and you want to benchmark it against that. Otherwise, you're just like, oh, hey, like it rained. We sold more umbrellas. Cool. If you could figure out how to make it rain, you'd make a much more money, <laughs> right? Like it's if you have the intention of, okay, we're going to do this thing. We're going to like whatever that is. If you're going to call every lead 10 times, that could be an intention. That may not a good one, but hey, it could be an intention. And then you have the outcome. What's the expected outcome? Hey, we, we expect that of those 10 phone calls, 50% are going to answer the phone and 10% of those are going to end up booking another call, whatever it might be. But it starts with the intention and you can have any intention in the world. And that's why people with like a little bit more uh, strategy and who've done it before might have better intentions. Uh, but if you don't measure the outcomes of the intentions, you end up going in a circle where you don't know what worked or what didn't work. And all you do is see that you didn't hit your KPIs or like your MQLs or any of the acronyms that people in marketing and sales love to say. <laughs> so share with us an example of uh, a good example of matching intentions and outcomes and a bad example of matching intentions and outcomes that you've seen. Yeah. So uh, if, if you have um, an offer right on a website, let's just start at the highest, the highest level is an offer on the website. If you add more questions to your form, why are you doing that? Right. That's, that's the question. So the intention, if I say, Hey, we want to know, their gender and you're like a like and you're a birthing consultant right like it probably makes a lot of sense or if you say hey what's your company size right how many how many employees does the company have you have to have an you could ask any you could ask 100 questions there's no limit to a form right like you could ask infinite questions so a good example of this would be okay we have a problem of getting so many calls that are just unqualified People that like are poke, kicking the tires, they're not just not qualified for what we offer as a service, as a um, as what we do. So what we should do, let, let's put in uh, a company size qualifier and a expected annual revenue on the form. So our intention is that we're going to get less leads and also be able to uh, kick out the ones that we don't even want to spend the 30 minute call with on our sales team. That's our intention. The outcome we then want to measure. Okay, are we getting the same number of people booking? How many people are booking? How many people are we closing, calling, all that jazz? So all those lagging indicators. But it starts with the intention of we're trying to cut down on the amount of non-helpful conversations that we're having. That's like a pretty good example that we see a lot of people start to implement once they say, oh, wow, 30% of our calls aren't working out or 90%, whatever percent, it doesn't matter. Um, and there's also a pretty good example of those things starting. A very bad example is where usually like not to like cast uh, any blame, it usually comes down to the people in like the automation side of things of where they're trying to automate either a follow-up sequence or automate a like some like some aspect of an automation where there's no intention they they lost the intention and they're just chasing the outcome. So like the goal is get someone to click this link. And so let's keep sending them the same email infinitely. Right? Like we're chasing the outcome, probably going to have more people click the link. And so like that's a bad example of like just where you're chasing the outcome with no intention. And that usually happens with automations because it's so easy to like drag a box and loop something or say, hey, send again or whatever it might be. So those are like two examples of where you, if you do something that might be like innately, like people just do it by themselves, right? But putting words to that of saying, hey, we have an intention. We're trying to do this thing. We're trying to get more sales calls. Awesome. Remove everything. Just have an email. <laughs> problem solved and then the outcome so that you know what you're trying to accomplish. So those, hopefully that made some sense there and didn't go too far down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it absolutely did. It's really what I think I can sum it up is like, don't just do things, have a strategy, like make sure you understand what the reason, the purpose, the why behind any and everything that you're doing within a sales organization is because otherwise you're just one 
throwing money at something that's not working continuously. And that doesn't help anyone ever at all, right? Um, so make sure you understand the underlying reason why. When you struck out, you said on your own, you said you became a freelancer and now you have a team. When, as an entrepreneur, how did you know it was time to start bringing new people into the fold to work with you? I think when people just started, too many calls were happening of where they're like, hey, we want to do this thing that you've done before. We heard from somebody else that you did this thing that for their team, and it's really great, and we want the same thing. And that just kept happening more and more and more. And it was like where people were saying, hey, we want this like marketing, um, we call it like the foresight system that's on the front end of like becoming a lead, right? Like on the website and um, those types of pieces. Like we want this. And so it, what happened was, is that more and more people were reaching out and I just was like, okay, I a want to take a vacation at some point in my life. So I have to have somebody else that can um, manage like all of our, our clients and all the relationships there. But I also want to be able to uh, like service these people because they're really awesome companies and they're really awesome partners. Cause most of our clients stick with us for years to manage a lot of this stuff for them. So that's the, the deciding factor was kind of those two things of being wanting able to, wanting to be able to take time off eventually and not disappoint a bunch of people of like, Hey, sorry, I'm going to be gone during your Q4 season of selling. Um, and then, uh, also be able to then service more people so we can have uh, a lot of awesome experiences. So as a, a entrepreneur that leads a team, what would you say one of the biggest challenges is for you now? Oh my goodness. Uh, I think the hard, the, yeah, the, there's so many. You know? I think the hardest part is when you go from being an entrepreneur um, of a single person where you're doing everything to then stepping back and be like, ev the goal isn't to have everyone do everything. The goal is to have somebody to do like the high end, like development work. There's so somebody to do the visualization and somebody to do this other piece and everyone understands what everyone's doing. Whereas previously it's just yourself and you're like, I do it all. I write the sales emails. I write the copy. I do the strategy. I set up the actual thing that we're doing. I like talk with the clients. I have to position this stuff. All that stuff is yourself. Whereas when you have a, um, a team that you're working with, everyone should have more of a specialty so that you know who to turn to for when some things go wrong. So that, that, I think that's the biggest learning curve. Yeah, it's as a, a business owner, as an entrepreneur, one of the biggest challenges that I see is if you're a service-based business, it's like, you know, everything's in your brain. <laughs> you are the product that is being sold. Your abilities are what's being sold. And so to have the patience to really get the new people up to speed, sometimes it can be a challenge. And knowing that you're really amazing doing these things. However, the person you hire may be amazing at one thing. And that's okay because you need that one thing off of you so that you can be freed up to do more of the things that you really enjoy doing. Yeah, exactly. 100%. Like that's the case. And I think that's also the case for like a lot of like organizations as well, where like you have the person who's worked there for 15 years and then that person just knows everything and they're the bottleneck, whether intentional or unintentional. And it's almost the same concept of when you're, when you hop into a new, uh, process, system, et cetera, of where's the problem. And usually with entrepreneurial businesses, the entrepreneurial is the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> usually. You just have to remove yourself. Yes. Remove yourself. Remove like, yourself. Easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> so in your very um, expansive career of doing, you know, uh, different things here and there, what would you say is an experience that has impacted the way that you show up to the world today? So back when I was more videographing, <laughs> video, in the more of that world, um, I had the opportunity to work with a missions department, so a nonprofit that would uh, work around the world. And so I got to go do a lot of an amazing, a lot of, um, amazing places around the world to film and tell the stories of locations. And the one that stands out is just that there was a, um, a prenatal clinic in uh, the Masai Mara of uh, central Kenya that um, was the only place that had a sterile birthing environment for 50 miles. 
And I was like, they're filming like them doing this. And the, it was just the, one of the most impactful things of like, where you, something you take for granted, like, so like help, like obviously like healthcare varies depending on like your socioeconomic standard, the United States versus other countries in the world, not talking about that, but just knowing that some people in the world don't even have access to like a sterile thing, like nothing is sterile um, and filming that experience. It really like, I think changed the way of like, uh, like I, I view uh, nonprofits and uh, giving and those types of things. I think that was one of the most impactful um, pieces of, of that previous life now. <laughs> yeah. Being able to see, you know, people who, whose lives aren't, who aren't as fortunate in uh, life as us. And so for you being able to capture that on video and photos, I can see how, you know, that experience as well as the experience, the things that you were able to capture were really impactful for, for those people who were involved in um, that neonatal unit in Kenya. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, just those experiences have really just changed me for the better, I think. So. Oh, that's awesome. Well, um, as we wrap up, I want you to share with the audience, what is the one best way that, that we can learn more about what you're doing? How can we connect with you? What is the one best way? Yeah, the one best way probably is just find me on like LinkedIn, JJ Reynolds. There's not too many of us out there. Um, and you can find all the links to everything from there. Uh, feel free to message me. I'm pretty friendly. So you can feel free to be like, hey, I listen to you here and I have a question. So don't don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, JJ, for your time, your talent and your expertise. This has been an amazing conversation. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And that was another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Remember, in all that you do every day, focus on one way to transform your sales. Until next time.